So I'm really excited about our next keynote speaker, uh, Leanne Hambly. And Leanne Hambly is with Leanne Hambly Associates. And she's joining us all the way from the United Kingdom. One of the nice things about these virtual events is we have the opportunity to have speakers from uh, across the world come and join us. Leanne has over 30 years in the career development field. She is renowned for the design and delivery of inspirational learning programs, insightful and practical consultancy, and a creative approach to individual career coaching. She has held senior lecturer posts at several universities and is co-author of Creative Career Coaching, Theory into Practice, which was published in 2019. We are pleased to have her address the NCDA members today. Leanne, thank you so much. And she will be presenting The Road More Traveled. Yeah, good, well, thank you very much. Um, absolute pleasure to be with you today from Nottingham. And yep, that's the Nottingham in England, home to Robin Hood, hence my slide. But I was actually um, really amazed to find you actually, you have 10 Nottinghams in the US and another in Canada. So um, just wanted to say hello to any fellow Nottingham people in the audience. Okay, so the title. Just, there we go, The Road More Traveled. Now, it's actually a pretty clunky title, that one. I wasn't happy when I, when I wrote it. And I thought, what is it? And it's because we're used to hearing the road less traveled. And um, changing the word less to more creates that degree of cognitive dissonance. And our brains don't like that. They like habits. They prefer the familiar, well-worn, newer pathways that are fast and automatic. So when we hit something unfamiliar, we get that feeling that it's not quite right. It doesn't feel natural. And it's the same for our clients. We're trying to encourage often our clients to step outside the comfort zone. Um, and that can feel clunky for them, unnatural, not right, not comfortable. But the good news, always has to be some good news, um, is that our brains are very creative, hence the topic today. Um, do you remember when you were a child, and whether, you, whether it was the fact that you were on the beach or mud, and I'm hoping this isn't just something we do in this country, but we used to, uh, in, in the UK, we used to uh, dam up water, create dams on the beach or in the mud, and uh, the water then had to find another way around it. And it's the same with our brains. Whenever it hits a block, there will be a moment where it feels that block and the, the discomfort, but it will find a way around, and we call that neuroplasticity. So today, in spite of that clunky title, um, I'm going to let me see if I can get the. Yep, I'm going to talk about um, the contemporary career, uh, that journey, and the implications for career work. In particular, the need for creativity in both ourselves and for our clients. Now, I'm going to set the scene. So, excuse me while I take a few minutes because some of this would be very familiar to you. That road, you can see the road picture there. Um, long been used to describe the career journey. Traditional theory tended to regard it as a linear, um, having a clear destination and route to get there. As career professionals, we know that life is really that straightforward. So you've got the wiggly road there. Best laid plans go awry. Life experiences change and expand our, self, our sense of who we are and the opportunities available. And the other thing is, you know, we're, we're in the midst of a pandemic, and that seems to be accelerating some of the features of the fourth industrial revolution. So we've got uh, increased globalization, automation, artificial intelligence, as I said, and that's actually becoming uh, increasing the degree of uncertainty. And although we might have periods of linear, linearity, and some people may still have linear career paths, increasingly for more of us, our paths are winding, um, and not very straightforward at all. So what does the contemporary career look like? Right, so as I said, you might be familiar, you're probably familiar with these terms. Um, so as I said, we might have periods of stability and linearity, but more than ever, people uh, simultaneously occupy a number of roles known as a portfolio career. We may move sideways, downshift, work for a number of employers, that's the boundaryless career. And increasingly, people create their own careers, perhaps working freelance, the Pratian career. And we know it's not all about paid work. We appreciate the work as any emotional, psychological, or physical effort that we expend on a task. 
And therefore, we need to value unpaid work, community work, caring roles, study, learning experiences. So I've got a little exercise I want you to try. I want you to keep that broad concept of career in mind. And I want you to consider what your career road is like at the moment. All right, so have a glance at those pictures, see if you relate to any, but they're just prompts. So if they don't, if you don't relate to them you know, exactly, then sort of tweak them, use your imagination, describe your own road. It might be that you have a couple of roads at the same, same time, or you might like another metaphor completely. So a roller coaster of a road. So just for the moment, and I can't actually read your chat, but you can see each other's. I'd like you to hold that picture in your head of your career journey at the moment. And as you picture it, what sensations arise? And does it feel good? Does it feel a little bit anxiety provoking? And pop it in chat if you're willing so you can appreciate and see each other's. And really, we're just seeing if this road metaphor works for you. Okay, so um, for many of you, things might feel more uncertain than ever. I know that when the pandemic hit, for me, my diary just went blank because <laughs> I'm self-employed. So, um, you know, great time of uncertainty. And uh, one of the things we therefore have to help our clients do is navigate that. And um, we often use the word VUCA, the, career, the modern career is volatile, uncertain, complex, and ambiguous. And how do we support our clients to navigate that journey? Well. Thankfully, there are many models and theories out there uh, which guide us. And those theories and models also outline the career management competencies required. Um, so you've got the NCDA guidelines. So if you look down on the, uh, the left-hand side, you've got the model uh, and the theories. And on the right-hand side, some of the career management competencies that our clients need, indeed, I think we all need them as human beings, to navigate that journey. What's really interesting, I want to pick up on something that Cathy said here, because um, a lot of the theories are psychological theories, and they tend to focus on the mindset, the personal qualities, such as persistence. But there are other theories that bring in the sociological side of things, um, and they look at the structures. And it's important to see that it's not just about our personal career management competencies. We need a network. We need allies. We need mentors. We need some of those people who are going to advocate uh, for us. Um, so nice balance there. Okay, so I haven't got time to go into all of those today. The ones I'm going to focus on are to do with mindset, uh, decision making and self concept, and then some of the coaching approaches that we can use to help our clients develop those. Now, when I say coaching, um, I mean facilitative, uh, avoiding our fix it tendency, we've all got it. Now, um, there we have uh, um, Eeyore from Winnie the Pooh and Sadness from the film Inside Out. Now, my natural default position is an Eeyore. Okay, so yes, I can do some positive psychology techniques. I can help myself feel more positive. But my default, where I'm having to work from, is Eeyore. Um, and there you have Tigger and Joy from the film Inside Out. And they rep represent that, that sort of very well-intended fix it tendency where people go, come on, it'll be all right. And they give you advice and suggestions. But when they do that, when I'm in that place, I really don't like it. It makes me feel worse. All right. So this is me. <laughs> if people go into advice giving a little bit too soon, okay, very, very grumpy. Um, and for our clients, it can be pretty much the same. They can be feeling it, like, like an awe or a sadness, anxiety, fear, very unsettled, their confidence can dip. And we have to tread carefully uh, when people are in that place. Um, so as I said, not going into the fix-it tendency, but being patient, being kind. Um, and it's a human need to feel empathized with and understood before perhaps we're willing to start looking forward. So uh, whilst I'm talking about creative coaching methods, um, at the heart of this is compassion. And I know it's something that uh, you as career professionals, you know, do incredibly well, because really, most of the time, it's why we've come into the job. It's why we do this very job. So I am talking about creative and compassionate uh, career coaching methods. 
Okay, so, so far, talk about career, uh, the need for career management competencies to navigate uncertainty and a compassionate coaching approach. And that sort of sets the scene. And what I want to do now is spend the rest of the time looking at some creative coaching methods. All right. And um, like Kathy, I love that Kathy did a brilliant definition of creativity. <laughs> so here we go. And uh, it really made me think of her because there are so many myths out there about creativity. All right. Um, and here are a couple. It's often linked with divergent thinking, that spontaneous, non-linear free flowing. But that's quite a narrow understanding. Um, and it leads to people saying, I'm not creative. But if you're a career practitioner, you're incredibly creative. I think um, Kathy said it's, it's often about re rearranging and adapting things. Um, and that's right, because when you're working in front of your clients and things don't seem to be working, you have to think on your feet and think, how do I adapt this? What, what can I try that might work? You are that swan. You are calm on the surface and paddling furiously underneath highly creative work. Um, so the other sort of myth is that right brain, that it's actually about the right brain. OK, and uh, that's, as I said, it's, isn't true either. Actually, the whole brain is used in creativity. Um, and I'm going to say that all the methods we're going to look at try to involve the whole brain. So I do need to say a little bit about uh, about this and um, one model for understanding the brain is dual processing theory so Stanovich and Kahneman now I'm hoping you're familiar with Star Trek and you will recognize one of my childhood heroes Captain James Kirk and his second in command Spock now Kirk represents the limbic bit of our brain and that's that's quite deep inside the brain it's emotional it's intuitive Spock represents and it's right at the front the cortex, which is logic, analysis, and conscious thought. So on their own, Spock and Kirk, I mean, they have their talents, but they're also flawed. Together, they are a brilliant team. All right. Now, this dual processing theory, um, system one, Kirk, as I said, intuitive, emotional, that stores habits. Now, they can be incredibly useful. So like when you learn to drive, it was with your conscious brain. You're like, ah, ah, now you drive automatically. It's stored as a habit. So you can do it whilst thinking about what you're having for dinner. Okay, you can do it unconsciously and automatically. That's its strength. But those habits can also get in the way of growth. That's where our comfort zone is. We form bad habits. And, and I want to relate a little bit to what Kathy said again, we have unconscious bias. That's where our cultural bias, our, you know, the way our life experience has formed the lens is what has created the lens through which we look at the world. System two, though, has its own limitations. And uh, I don't know whether sometimes you get this when you just have too much information to take in and you get that cognitive overload. So you can't cope with quite as much information at the same time. It also misses the emotion, the subjective side of reality, and it misses some of the you know, the, the contextual factor, factors that influence career decisions. So implications for us. Okay, we need to engage the whole brain, system one, two. We need to work with thoughts and feelings. Um, and you can see there, Spock and Kirk getting on like a house on fire. So we need to use both. That's when at their best. Okay, so there are so many methods out there that engage the limbic and the cortex. But you know, as soon as you're using card sorts, the kinesthetic feel of cards starts to engage that more experiential sensory bit of the brain. Okay. Um, so I'm going to go through some of them. I'm going to keep my eye on time because I may not get through all of them. I always do this. I always put way too much in the presentation, but I will actually keep it, keep it going. Um, sorry, we just see that somebody said about the volume increased. I'm turn, I've just turned my, I'm hoping this is better. I've just turned up as much as I can, my volume. Hey, you might get some heavy breathing. Um, so I'm going to try and go through all of these methods, uh, as I said, depending on time. Now, let's kick off with the first one, metaphor. And I know that you uh, know Norm Adminson very well, and indeed he's my go-to person um, in terms of you know, learning about how to use metaphor. They're brilliant for diving deeper, 
and for reframing some of those deeper habits that are hard to shift, those habitual thoughts that are hard to shift. They're brilliant for that. Now, at the beginning, um, I use the road metaphor just to see and want you to think about this. Did that road metaphor work for you? And that's me using quite a universal metaphor. Um, but ideally, you're going to be listening out for the client's metaphors. And you can see there are a number of very common metaphors. Um, and uh, I'm going to talk through how I helped, well, how I helped, how I supported one of my clients in using metaphor. And I'm going to take the gardening one, the one down in the bottom right hand corner. Now, one of my clients, he was in his 50s and he'd been out of paid work for over a year. Uh, he lived in a rural area where jobs are few and far between, and he was losing hope of finding employment. When we talked about how he spent his time, he mentioned his allotment. And I think, I think they're called community gardens with you. Um, so we relate his, his experience to a year on the allotment. And you can see, let me just go through some of the questions there. Um, you know, that actually try to you know, look at what season was it at the moment. So obviously it was very much like winter. He felt hard to go down there, not very motivated. Uh, not much growing, not much happening. And that's how his, his job search felt like at the moment. But he still went down. He still went down the allotment to the garden. And basically, he was preparing for spring. We don't know when spring's going to come. Um, and I asked him what he did. And he told me about how he prepared the ground, how he mended tools. And you might be familiar with the modern theory of planned happenstance. And this is where we, uh, we applied this. Sometimes we don't know when things are going to happen. Sometimes things are out of our control. But what you can control is how you prepare for that event. And so what could he do in the winter of his job search to help prepare? And uh, we discussed things like networking to improve the access to the hidden job market, his resume, his interview skills, getting ready for when an opportunity might come his way. Or even by doing that, create his own opportunities. So that reframing, using that metaphor, helped him feel more optimistic and motivated to take action. So as I said, if you want to know more about metaphor, using metaphor, Norm Adamson's work and his book, books are great to go to. OK, so moving away from mindset and metaphor, decision making is at the heart of what we do. And, and with that winding road, people have to make decisions more and more frequently. Um, you know, it used to be you might make some early decisions and then you were on that linear trajectory. Um, so we're making constant decisions. Traditional approaches tended to rely on the rational matching approach, that weighing up the pros and the cons, uh, weighting criteria, and so on. Um, okay. uh, but as mentioned, it's actually only 7% of our decisions are made by that part of the brain. Right. It's brilliant for decisions where you have all the information available and there aren't too many variables. It's good anyway for aiding reflection and providing food for thought in careers work, but it's not so brilliant for complex decisions, okay, where there's, uh, as I said, a lot of contextual factors and emotions at play. So you can see there what each one is good for, but as I said, they're limited. Um, so if we're really going to work well with our clients, we need to use both. Um, so what I'm going to take you through is a method that I use with my clients. Okay. And um, ideally, wouldn't it be wonderful? So just think uh, if you had a time machine and you could take it forward and that client had a number of options and they could actually try them out and see what life was like if they had made that decision. Okay. And that would be experiential, so they could experience it. And then they could reflect on what they'd seen, what they'd touched, what they'd felt, and that would help them make the decision. We haven't got time machines, but what we have got is the next best thing, which is the imagination. So we're going to use the imagination to create an experiential um, sensory inhabiting of the different options and then reflect on it. And that's the whole brain approach. OK, so let me describe. I'm hoping you're familiar with visual, what you see, kinesthetic, what you touch, what you feel, audio, what you hear, gustatory, taste, 
olfactory smell, five main senses. Right. So, this is, as I said, this is a method I use with my clients. So to access the limbic brain and make it sensory, I ask the client to write down their options on bits of paper, scrumple them up, right, mix them so they don't know which is which, and that makes it kinesthetic. That's already triggering the limbic bit of the brain. Right? They open each one in turn. So they open the first one, say that option out loud. That's auditory. They feel it in their you know, as you speak, you feel it. It's different from when it's in your head for some reason. And then they use the imagination to fully inhabit it, to imagine that they've chosen that option, that they're there to describe what they're doing, what they see, whether there's any smells, what they hear, what they taste, if it's a taste. And they do it for each of the options. And they notice as they inhabit it, how they feel about it. Right, now, there's a little bit more to it than that. So I'm just going to describe one of my clients. I'm going to call her Jane. Um, and uh, Jane was struggling to decide between training as an elementary school teacher or as a school counsellor. And she'd gone through the pros and cons until she felt her head was going to explode. So I suggested this activity. She wrote the options down on bits of paper as instructed. She scrunched, mixed them up. I asked her to open the first, say it out loud, teacher. And she inhabited it. She imagined the classroom, the children, the typical day. You probably use that question, describe a day in the life of. Okay. And I asked her how she felt inhabiting that role. And she said, fine. We did the same for the school counsellor. And she knew less about that option. So we accessed some information first. And then she imagined a typical day, the environment, the cases she was dealing with. And when I asked how she felt, she actually said initially she felt quite anxious. Didn't know what it was about, she just felt anxious. But as it went on, it became easier. Now, this is where your insights come in as a career professional. So you are facilitating it, but you're doing more than that. Okay, so these, these instructions are, are there. You can see we've just done the first three. But that bit of the brain, the limbic bit of the brain, communicates through body language. Uh, through tone and uh, everything you pick up that is not just about the content of what the client is saying. So you observe, you listen carefully, and then you reflect back without judgment and tentatively, in case you've got it wrong, what you have observed. So for me, and you're probably thinking this already, the word fine was said without much enthusiasm. <laughs> Whereas when she described being a school counsellor, she did look at anxious initially, but then she started to smile more. So I tentatively reflected that back. And that behind the decision, behind that surface decision was another decision that had to be made, whether to choose something familiar or something new. So if you do spot a decision behind the decision and the client agrees that that's the case, then you can ask questions such as, well, what would you give somebody, what advice would you give somebody else in the same situation? And quite often they can see what they want to choose. Or you can repeat the activity with two new bits of paper. Choose something familiar, choose something new. And we did the latter. When she opened the bit of paper with choose something familiar, she said she felt disappointed about the heaviness in her stomach. When she chose, so opened the bit of paper, said choose something new, she felt that excitement. Now she actually did train as a school counselor. Um, but it's interesting that initially the, what she felt most anxious about became the thing she chose. And that's what we're trying to do is to use the imagination to help people step outside the comfort zone, inhabit it, feel it. And the brain seems to think that's now a possibility. Um, okay, you can develop that activity further. There's loads of ways with chairs or you can chuck other options in or take options away. You'll see there are reference to the research that lay behind this. So if you do want to know more, you can just go to my website and read a bit more about that. But the other thing is, try it out. Try it tonight. What are you going to have for tea? A bit of paper, pizza or salad? Okay. Um, and you know, can you taste it? What does it feel like? And you might say, well, that's easy. That's going to be pizza. All right. But then you imagine, how will you feel afterwards? That might shift you to salad. With all of these methods, you just play with them. Try them out. Gain confidence. Okay. Okay. So... Um, I'm keeping my eye on the time, five minutes left. Backwards action planning. 
All right, now, uh, in the UK, we're a bit obsessed with smart action points and, um, you know, they've got their value. But sometimes you look up at that mountain and you see all the steps that need to be taken and it can feel overwhelming, um, a bit off-putting. And especially for some of our neurodiverse clients. All right, now, I've, again, I've put an article there. Um, if you want to find out more, it's on my website. Okay. So an alternative approach to the traditional uh, action planning is backward action planning. All right, it's got its roots in sports psychology, business psychology. Again, you're using the imagination. Imagine you're there, you've reached your goal. Okay, so what does it look like? Inhabit it. You've made it. Um, uh, what you see, what you notice, feel it. And from that place of inspiration, you, you're at the top of the mountain, you look back. How did you get there? What challenges did you overcome? What differences it made? Like what resources did you need? Make it more kinesthetic, you know, use sticky notes. Do you mean to write each action point and then you can put them in order. Better still, use the room. Um, create a path of action points. If it looks too daunting, just stand on the first step. How does it feel if you took that? Or midway. So again, it's just playing with it, but it involves, it's experiential as well as reflective. So it's amazing what sort of things can shift. Finally, this is a tough one. Okay. Um, now I wanted to get to this one because uh, Kathy mentioned or somebody's question was about imposter syndrome. And uh, what do we do when people rationally, they might know they can do something, but they still feel it. <laughs> uh, and that can be a bit tricky. It can be a bit tricky to move some, shift some of those habitual thoughts. All right, so um, the, it, you might be familiar with the dialogical uh, method, work of some people like Hermans. And first step is if you hear people saying things, say these beliefs come out, is to try and help them gain some critical distance and see it as a part of themselves, okay? We call them I positions, it's a part of themselves. And we're made up of many parts, but we need to stop over identifying. I need to stop over identifying with Eeyore. Right, maybe I need to identify with Tigger more. Um, so you basically are trying to get to see those parts, but compassion comes in here again because that part was there for a reason. Um, and it might have been when you were younger that, say, being quiet or pleasing people, keeping your head down. Maybe that was wise when you were younger, but it's not serving you now. So we want to acknowledge that part, uh, but we need to create some balance and find a new voice that can balance that voice. And I just love using chair work for this. All right, so we can sit in one chair, that's the bit that they express that's holding them back, but then sit in another chair that feels different. And there's a wise chair as well. But again, I want to take you through a client case because I think that really illustrates it. I had a client, let's call him Andy, and every time he was in a job interview, he just froze. Uh, and he had this belief he couldn't do job interviews. So he sat in that, that chair, and to help him almost gain some critical distance, we gave that part of him a name. And he said, right, it's anxious, Andy. And I said, right, you're there in an interview. Tell me everything that anxious Andy thinks and feels. And he took me through that. And he was so good at it. He said, oh, I'm starting to sweat now. I'm starting to feel really uncomfortable. Right. Um, so we sat in the other chair said, is there a time or a place when you're not, you know, anxious, you're really confident? And that's a solution focus question. And he said, rock climbing. I said, right, rock climbing, Andy. Take me through how he feels when he's climbing. And he described it again, he used the imagination. And he said, oh, yeah, I'm actually feeling it. I, I can feel that confidence. And you create a dialogue between these two parts. Uh, but very useful chair the wise self, and he sat in that chair, looked at those, said, how can we bring confident Andy into the interview and anxious Andy to you know, take a backward step? And the advice was to wear his rock climbing watch and behind the interviewing panel, picture the rock climbing wall. And he did that. Uh, he took his rock climbing watch, his next interview, he took his rock climbing watch in, um, and he, he, he didn't get that job. They actually offered him a more senior position. And he said it was a totally different experience. So if we are working with people with a sense of lack of confidence, 
it's a part of them. There will be a small voice somewhere and we're trying to strengthen that voice and share work is a really good way of doing it. So again, if you want to know more, I would just suggest reading about it. You, know, you want to get confident in that method, but it just shows how if you use the whole brain, you can shift some of the deeper beliefs. Okay, I've come to the end, little whistle stop tour. I did manage to get through them. Um, what I want to sort of say is just, it's about balance, okay? Whole brain combined reflection with experiential. We want creative methods, but they have to be compassionate. Uh, we need some stability. Our clients need some stability in order to face that river of life. They need to review their existing skills and strengths and feel good about them and then look at the new skills. Okay, so thank you very much for listening. Um, there's my details, do connect. And if you do want to know more, that's that's my book, co-authored with somebody because I couldn't do it on my own. Uh, and, uh, and I think it's um, opening up for questions. Hello? If you guys have any questions for Leanne, you can check, uh, type those into the chat section and we'll help her get through those. Can you hear me okay in the end? I could see a little comment about. Yes, it, it was a little bit quiet, but I, I could hear you just fine. Okay. Yes, there's a few people say they could hear fine. That's good. I mean, I have gone rather quickly through the methods. If anybody has any, you know, they want me to slow down or say about them. And one thing I will say is just that they are only alternatives. Do you know what I mean? One method, I think that's what Cassie said, you've got to adapt and you've got to be willing to try different things. They won't work for everybody. Oh, this is a good one. Any ideas for doing chairs via Zoom session? Yes, I actually do use... Um, chair work. I do it on the telephone, actually. I do all of these methods on the telephone. Telephone is brilliant for young people who don't like being looked at. So I get them to describe their room, how many chairs they've got, and I just listen to the voice. Um, and so they do sit in different chairs. Zoom, a little bit more awkward than the telephone, but we start off and I say, we've got a few chairs. If they haven't, then what we use is something else. So perhaps a bit, I would use a piece of paper with anxious Andy on and another bit of paper with confident Andy on, and we would hold those. Um, and I've just seen, yes, yeah, somebody else put, uh, uh, but what, yes, somebody else said, but regarding metaphor images, why I present nine images. No, I'd actually let them choose. I actually have, <laughs> that's one of the hard things about Zoom is that there's a limited screen uh, shape. Um, we, I actually have metaphor cards, do you mean they spread them out and there's like loads of them, they can pick them. Ideally, young people in particular are really good at metaphors. So if they come from them, the better. And you just listen out for the metaphors that they use. Um, long, oh, good question about trust. Um, I think it depends. Some clients are well in there and they'll work uh, with these in one session. Andy was more, uh, I, I had two sessions with Andy. We had the first session to build that trust depends on the person, I think. Um, and time needed, actually all of these can be adapted to a more simple version. So I've kind of told you the, the pure version. Um, I've seen, for example, the decision-making, you know, just quickly the, the advice saying, right, let's take that away from you. You can't do that. How do you feel? Right, let's take that one away from you. How do you feel? And you can speed the whole thing up and adapt it and adapt the level at which you uh, operate. Um, have I missed any there? Got some people who love metaphor. Metaphor's fab, I mean, I think, and some of the things, they take less time. It's funny enough, they take less time than a, than a, a pros and cons, because sometimes there's just so many pros and cons that you go <laughs> round and round the houses. Um, So yeah, I actually think they can all be adapted to phone or Zoom. Actually, most of my clients, that's how I work with them. Um, and we have fun. I always tell them beforehand, bring post-it notes, colored pens, 
uh, whatever, uh, so that we can make it as kinesthetic and as experiential as possible. Um, the metaphor slide again. I uh, don't know whether I'm in control now. Oh, I am. Yes, I'm still in control. <laughs> uh, that one. Uh, do you know, I just got those off Google. I just think you can. Um, the cards I've got are allowed to print now, unfortunately. Um, I know that uh, um, Norm Admonson has a set of metaphor cards uh, that you can download um, and print off. Uh, but I would just, uh, you know, get them all off Google and get as many as possible. Just think about your clients and what metaphors you hear. Um, now, this is good. Yes. How do you, do you ask permission? Do you know what? That's a really good question because sometimes I find contracting isn't that good. <laughs> well, I, I also assess practitioners and um, I think we, we're not as transparent about all of our methods. So we kind of just do pros and cons and we don't make it transparent, but it's just one method and approach. And I think we need to get really good at outlining different methods and saying, what would you like? So some of my clients choose pros and cons, others choose more visual and kinesthetic. I think we need to be a lot more transparent in contracting um, and yes, get permission, but not just to do this, to do any activities, I think. These are great questions. You can see I've got two screens, sorry, so I'm not looking at you as I'm answering, I'm reading your questions. Leanne, I think there was one that you may have missed. Um... What are some more resources for learning about more about backwards action planning? Ah, um, of course, I'm going to say it's in my book, but actually, um, Lock and Latham, if I go to, um, I think you can, sport, if you can look at sports psychology, I mean, where I'm less familiar of the, the authors, um, but you've got people like Lock and Latham, Hargrove. Uh, you know, there's quite a few people, especially Hargrove, actually, he's written quite a lot and you can go on his website um, and talk about it. Um, it really is also though, just keeping it quite simple. Uh, I know they do when people run marathons, they imagine they've done it, how it feels, and then they work out the schedule. Um, and it's always because it's from a place of inspiration. And I think it's much easier to action plan when we're inspired. So yeah. Good question. There's your authors. Any others? So I think Norm Admanson actually, I'm trying to remember the site he's developed with his daughter. Double Knot, I think it's Double Knot. Um, you can download, you can, it's only really, really about $10, I think, for some metaphor cards. Uh, and there's a book on using metaphor as well. Uh, if they're hesitant to do it, I don't do it. Do you know what I, mean? I mean, it depends. I, I sort of ask them if they're willing to work through that hesitancy um, or whether they'd rather stay with sort of safer activities. And this is what I mean by transparency and constantly recontracting and contracting. Um, I really wouldn't make anybody do anything. They're not, you know, they're really not up for, but I actually find that some people get fed up with the question answer, just look and being looked at all the time, you know, and actually doing um, and using the room. And some of them just love it. They might feel initially a bit uncomfortable, but as I said, I asked them if they're willing to uh, go through that. I've got some clients who've got ADHD. I don't know whether, what term you, you use, but you know, I've got a client, she loves all of this. She hates sitting still. <laughs> so we do loads of this. Any others? I missed any others? Great. No, none that I've seen. We still have a few more minutes if anybody has any other questions for her. I mean, the, it says the book, I'm, I'm assuming, is that, if it's my book, you can get it from anywhere. It's, it's uh, um, neuro atypical client ideas. Yeah, and I think it's that thing that once, you, say for example, people think, oh, people with autism, uh, can't do metaphor and I think it's that thing that once you've met one autistic person you've only met one autistic person and some people are brilliant some aren't um, and that's why I think we need to be our toolkit has to be quite 
the large. And the great thing about many neuroatypical clients is they'll tell you how they like to work um, and they'll tell you how they like to communicate. Uh, so again, it's just being very direct and asking those questions. Um, and I ask them all my clients, how do you like to work? How do you like to communicate? What type, what do you like? Is it a visual doing or just question answer? Um, graduates during an uncertain time. Uh, I actually share with them the career management competencies, um, like your NCDA guidelines. And actually I do have cards with career management competencies on. And I ask them to look at what they already have. Um, so have they got concern? Have they got curiosity? Um, are they aware of their values, their transferable skills? Very much like the man on the allotment, actually, with the community garden. What can they be doing to increase their chances? Uh, it's a plant happenstance approach. It's all about accessing the hidden uh, job, in their, you know, job market. It's about the preparation so that when things happen, you're ready. Or, as I said, sometimes through networking, you create your own. My favorite book is The Crumb Bolts and Levin, Luck is No Accident. Um, yeah, that is it. That is, that is made to actually, Andy, there's a really good point. Andy is naming it as part of himself because he is over-identified with the anxiety. It's a part of him. And therefore, it is an inaccurate belief. And so by sitting in that other chair, he got in touch with the confident Andy. Um, you're right. And the wise Andy is giving a yeah, very good point there. Um, it's finding his true self. We are all in a process of becoming and trying to let go or of some of our limiting beliefs and things that hold us back and become who we are capable of. And new chairs and sitting in areas um, and discovering new parts of yourself is wonderful. Drama is fantastic for that. So if you've got any drama people out there, um, role, you know, just inhabiting roles and realizing that you can be more than you think you are. We're held back by our self-concept. Good point. Do, do connect through LinkedIn. Um, I've made so many good friends uh, in uh, the US and colleagues. And I've said that's the wonderful thing about all this online is that we're getting to know each other a lot better internationally so please do all right thank you leanne